Harambe! 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 The who is who that needed to be informed were flown to Mombasa at dawn. They say about 4 a.m. That was when PC Elud Mahihu yet again called police headquarters command center asking Wambugu to raise Air Force Commander Colonel Dedan Ishuru and inform him to fly a military caribou plane from Isili to Mombasa to airlift the body, which had to be flown by the commander himself. Instructions which were not well received by the Air Force boss. And when he woke up, after listening to all I had to say about him having to fly to Mombasa, <coughs> is when he, he asked me what my rank was, and I said, Inspector, sir, since when did inspectors give colonels instructions? I said, these are not instructions, sir. I'm just passing the information from State House to you. So he didn't say he's not going. We were not communicating on normal telephone. We were communicating on radio telephone, which is real like telephone because it is wired, but it is just, again, like the 2i8 <laughs> phone, which you swing something until somebody answers on the other hand. So I know he took the instructions because he came, and when he got to the easily busy, other things had happened, which I wasn't in charge, like uh, the tower was opened and things like that. Then I got instructions for a second caribou. Today, I know the second caribou was going to act like uh, the air has for the body of the president. And again, I was talking to a colleague of mine called uh, Captain Wanyoike. He's a man we knew each other very well. And he continued to protest that he has no place to provide for that purpose. And I said to him, Captain, I'm not requesting you. You refuse to send the plane to Mombasa at your peril. Finally, he took, because duty officer, particularly at those times of crisis, does not have the luxury of arguing with you. I'd been there several times when uh, certain crises were there, and I managed them, and I knew how to act, because I'm the same one who was there when Kenya was plane was blocked in Cairo <laughs> because another plane had been blocked in Nairobi, which was destined for Somalia. So this kind of communication has to be briefest and the point. As the clock ticked towards 6 a.m., instructions were received from Police Commissioner Bernard Hinga that flags across the country should fly at half-mast. But it did not register in the mind of a clearly overwhelmed Wambugu that President Kenyatta had died. Slightly before six, I got instructions to fly all the national flags, including service flags, half-mast. And that is the point at which I, it was disclosed to me that the president is normal. And uh, I'm the one who called every province. Of course, if I talk to a PC and a PPU, I know that province has been informed. And I did that. And uh, having had the reason why you are flying the flags half-mast, the volume of work on my desk did not allow me even to start worrying about the president's death. Much I, as you'll understand that if I, at one moment, stop to think the president is dead, I wouldn't have known how I'm supposed to behave because I don't know, I didn't know, a Kenya without Kenyatta. So it is me who lowered the flags half-mast countrywide, and I forgot about it until it was time for me to hand over the current book to my, uh, to my colleague, and I walked out, and the duty vehicle was waiting for me. Then at the, at the entrance of the police headquarters, I saw the, the flags were half mast, and I couldn't remember it is me who had said they'd be lowered. So instead of getting into the vehicle, I went back upstairs. I said, Babu, what is happening? And he laughed because even some of the conversation I was having with other people while he was sitting there doing nothing <laughs> implied that Kenyatta was dead. So he already knew that Kenyatta is dead, and he couldn't understand how I don't know. His challenge on the hot seat continued. Attorney General at that time, Sir Charles Njonjo, called the command center issuing instructions for an impromptu cabinet meeting at 9 a.m., 
which was pushed to 11 a.m. And 10 minutes to 11, the scheduled meeting was further rescheduled to avert a potential constitutional and political crisis. Then Vice President Daniel Toretich Arap Moy, who was mandated by the Constitution to chair the cabinet in the event of the president's demise, could not be reached. I had not found one important person, the then Vice President. And uh, it was instructions. It can't take place unless the Vice President is there, which happened. Tracing him, employing everything in our, uh, available to us, to the extent now of using <laughs> aeroplanes and helicopters. And uh, the challenge was in locating him, which we did. First of all, he was not anywhere where we could reach him on the phone. He, nobody was speaking uh, their mobile walkie-talkie. Uh, they, they only agreed to communicate when Madenge called them. And actually that was, <laughs> was the breakthrough because once Madenge talked to them, it happened that Madenge and Moi were very good friends. Madenge, uh, Moi would never be flown by any other pilot. Because like, you know, in Kenyatta's last years of life, he never used to fly. Moi used to fly. But he wouldn't allow any other pilot from police having to fly him. He liked being flown by Madenge. The police inspector who had worked overnight was still manning the occurrence book, which meant he could not end his shift before the cabinet meeting was held. With the whereabouts of the then Vice President Moi remaining unknown, Wambugu had to seek the assistance of then Police Air Wing Commandant, Assistant Police Commissioner Madenge. Let me say when I talk to the Commandant, the other logistics were not mine. Because it is him, he flew one plane and I think he flew, another plane was flown by another pilot. It is not even me who decided that there should be a helicopter or two in uh, Nakuru. I did not give instructions to those pilots. But uh, because of communication, like when he was reporting that he has been able to trace them, he had to tell them, uh, to tell me. Because you see, Nakuru airstrip was not a Monday airstrip. So he had to tell me he is now flying back to Nakuru. He had to tell me he is now flying the helicopter for, for the rescue. Uh, and when he flew the helicopter, he did not land in Nakuru again. He came straight to Nairobi. There were claims that there was a possibility that Vice President Moy did not trust the news sources about Kenyatta's death and that he may also have had reservations about a cabal of Kenyatta's kitchen cabinet, which had plotted to block him from succeeding Kenyatta. It was shortly after 11.30 a.m. when Assistant Commissioner of Police Madenge finally got caught up with him deep in the ravine valleys. The report I got is that the vehicles were left somewhere. If the vehicles were there and the people were not there, the next thing was to find out where were they. And then they saw them walking. They were using uh, oysters. Oysters are like the ropes you could, you could drop and uh, pick somebody because there was no landing site for the helicopter there. I don't even think he came with the entire troop. I think he, he, just, he was just hoisted him and one other guy who could have been maybe the commandant of the uh, vice president's escort. Vice President Daniel Toretich Arap Moy was sworn in by Chief Justice Sir Charles James as acting president, and he then presided over the cabinet meeting. Moy ruled Kenya for 24 years until December 2002. It was not until midday later that fateful day that Wambugu signed off from the police headquarters. On his way out, he recalls that he bumped into the convoy, ferrying the late president's body, which had been flown to Moy Airbase in Italy. A few minutes to one is when we, we met with the house carrying the president. And as the vehicle was passing along Georgia Road, both sides of the road, life was normal like it always is. It is me who told my friend in the car, including the driver who was driving us, this is the president's body. We were coming from Italy and uh, it was a quiet drive, very slowly and nobody was noticing. 
Then when we passed, we went straight home. In fact, we didn't want to stop anywhere. We wanted to get home near the radio and put it on and see whether we'll get that. Luckily, when we got home, they had not announced, but we got martial music, which was literally interrupted. Now, who was it? Was it Leonard Mambo? Some, some name, common name in VUK. That martial music was interrupted, announcing the death of the president. Which now, even though I knew, I must say it also sounded shocking. Uh, so Kenyatta must have been dead if he died at three. And if this was, say, two o'clock, during that period he was dead, nobody knew he was dead. Except, of course, those people who were the newsmaker, the ones who were managing the affair. Mm. And uh, after it was announced, the whole country became kind of lukewarm, and uh, even people were afraid to go to the bar. The, most of the people left their places of work and went home. And like I'm saying, being one of the Kenyans, I'm sure uh, most of us didn't know how Kenya looks like without Kenyatta. In August 2017, during Kenyatta's 39th memorial service, his son, President Uhuru Muigai, would reveal to the nation the role played by the choir of St. Stephen's Jogorod SEK Church during his family's mourning period on the loss of Mze Kenyatta. President Kenyatta II was only 18 years old when his father died. As an 18-year-old, this choir went a long way towards calming us, giving us solace during a very difficult moment in our lives. They were together with us almost every single day. And I believe it was not just us as a family, but also to the entire nation. And to that, we shall ever remain grateful to you, to those who came before you. As a family, we are indebted to you. As a nation, I believe you played a critical role in ensuring that the country stays together, the country remained united, and I think I can say with a clear conscience that you were part of helping Kenya move forward after a very difficult time when people did not know what was going to happen, but your songs and the words in your songs really encouraged Kenyans and gave Kenyans hope that there was a future after that unfortunate event. So Asante Nisana, friend. Asante. Simon Mwangi Wambugu, who retired from the police force, now runs an investigation and security consultant firm. Duncan Hemba, The Untold Story.